Well, this morning, uh, I'm not preaching this morning. I know you're all very disappointed, but we have, we have, we have a guy named Barry. He's okay. <laughs> I've, I've known Barry for quite a while. He's, he's awesome. Um, <laughs> he's okay. He, uh, actually, it's been a while. I've gotten this book a while ago, and uh, amazing book. Just really, really good book. And, but uh, as I said, I've known Barry for a while. Uh, uh, he's the administrator down at Red Deer, uh, among many other things. He's he's kind of a he's a male version of Amanda, I guess we could say. Kind of, he kind of does a little of everything. But he has his own ministry as well. Uh, he's been involved uh, doing stuff for uh, full time uh, in the ministry since 2001, and. Uh, He's here with his, his wife, Cheryl, who is definitely more than likely the same as Amanda is to me in guidance and teaching and reminder. And um, he has the founder of My King Ministries in, in uh, Red Deer. Uh, he's also the, as I said, the administrator of now uh, Impact in Canada. Yes, so that's changed. That's now Impact in Canada. Uh, so he's just... Uh, uh, as I said, amazing book. Uh, it really opens your eyes to things you don't necessarily uh, would think you'd find in a Christian, I guess, you know. Uh, but we all we all have things that we have to work on. But Barry is uh, he's an amazing guy, and we're happy to have him here. We're excited to hear him, what he has to say. So, Barry, right. come on up. And yes. Okay. Well, I think I, oh, I am done. Perfect. I wasn't sure. I pressed the button, and there I am. Thank you, Pastor Tim and Amanda. It's good to be here. It's always a privilege to be able to share in someone else's church. It's a responsibility, and when you're given the, the opportunity, you need to take that seriously because you're sharing in someone else's church. And I've known Pastor... Uh, 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 Doug and Sveta for nine years. That's when I originally came to Red Deer to, uh, it used to be Canada Word of Faith Ministries and, and, uh, and, and began to really just be an executive administrator uh, of the ministry and, uh, and the church there it used to be the Family Faith Church. Like I say, that's changed impacting Canada Ministries. And I, know, and I knew uh, Pastor Doug because he's always been on the board. He's always been a board member, and so he's come to Red Deer. I've met him uh, right at the very beginning. And as uh, soon as you meet Pastor Doug and Sveta, you know that's quality. Amen. Those are quality leaders, and those are quality people. They love the Lord. They love people. They love their church. Every time you talk to them, it's all about the, the kingdom. It's all about reaching people with the gospel. It's all about the truth of the gospel being in people, healing, restoring. Yeah all those things. So it's a privilege to be here uh, this morning. The, uh, like Pastor Tim said, this is Cheryl, and I've known Cheryl since she's been 15. Wow. Yeah, wow. 40 years. Wow. We've uh, been married 37 this year, 37 wow. years this year, so yeah. amen, yeah. blessed yeah. from school. Uh, yeah. Pastor Doug and Smith said, can you come and share in the book a little bit? And so let me just tell you how this book came to be. I, I received the outline for this book back in Calgary in an office that I had in an upstairs bedroom. I was working for Victory Bible College International there. I was an associate dean. And, uh, you know, there was some transition going on. And I was praying actually on my knees by a futon in, 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 an, in the office that I had there. And one of my legs were falling asleep. <laughs> right? Because I was on my knees. And so I kind of just went on the side of my leg and I kind of stretched it out. And I looked right into the closet. And in the closet in that bedroom, there was a cardboard box. And on that box, it said fragile. And I heard the Spirit of the Lord say on the inside of me, are you a fragile Christian? And I thought, what does that mean, Lord? Am I a fragile Christian? And when I looked back at that box, I instantly knew the acronym for fragile. And the Holy Ghost said to me, fear rejection, anxiety, guilt, intimidation, lies, and excuses make us fragile Christians. And I thought, wow, that's not me. You know, I can't make that up just, uh, just, just instantly. And so I got up and I wrote that down because I thought someone should write a book on that someday. 
I had no plans of writing a book. Uh, we did pastor for five years, and so I've, you know, preached on these things. But it was about, four, about three or four years ago, the Lord said, you write the book. And I'm like, oh, Lord, I, I didn't, I only like, got like 57 in English, I think it was, <laughs> in high school. And, uh, but anyway, so I started, it took me about a year and a half, and then sent it off to the publishers, and then they edited it so it sounds better than me. Uh, but yeah, it's just been a blessing. So it's just an obedience thing. I just felt that that's, this is what the Lord wanted me to do. And so Pastor Sveta said, I read the book, and it's going to be really good for our church. And so uh, we, have it in, we have it in the back. Um, we have debit and credit on the square and cash, of course, and we're just selling them for $15 uh, a piece. And so if you like a book later on, that's, that would just, uh, we just want to, be able to bless and get it out any way possible. So, amen. Let me pray. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Father, that this morning, Father, we are, we are and will be changed. Lord, we will and are be better, Lord, that we will and we are, and we, uh, are going to be uh, uh, full of the word of God. I thank you, Lord, this morning for your word. I pray that it goes from me with a heart of humility, Lord, for it is the power of the word that's going to change. It's the power of the word that's going to restore. It's the power of the word that's going to heal, Lord, this morning. And I just pray, Father, that I'd be able to share it as the Spirit wants me to share it, Lord, that I'd be able to share it, Lord, this morning as you want me to share it so that people are increased, people are better, people have known that they've been in the presence of God today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And worship was great. I don't know who the worship leader is, but you know, some worship, uh, you know, just fills in time. <laughs> some worship's nice, but some worship preaches. Amen. amen. And your worship preached this morning to me, and it was, it was good. So, amen. I don't know who the worship leader are, uh, is, but, uh, and, and of course, the team together, that, but that was good. Amen. So, of course, I can't preach on all seven of those things this morning, or we would be here till tomorrow morning. And we would have to have lunch and maybe not have lunch. We could just go with uh, Tim's thing. He can share, what do you have, some gum and water? We can <laughs> split it up. And <laughs> so, I thought, Lord, you know, what can I do on a Sunday morning? Uh, uh, from the book, and I've preached a number of uh, times in a few places, uh, just generally on the book, and the subtitle is Overcoming Unhealthy Thoughts. And so this morning, really, right and wrong thinking, that's what I want to look at this morning, right and wrong thinking. Uh, and when I wrote the book, I didn't realize how much thinking or the mind is in the Bible. And of course, we got to be careful when we go there, because sometimes when we preach on the mind, people think, oh, you're just going to get into some strange territory. You're going to get into some of that positive thinking territory, some of those positive thinking techniques and get in that whole arena, right? But do you know those self-help gurus got it from the Word of God originally? Yeah. And they're the ones that take and twist it and mess with it a bit. But in the Word of God, it is, it is powerful what God talks about in the mind. So let me just give you a number of scriptures just so you know we're not way out there in left field. 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Philippians 2.5, Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Matthew 22, 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Isaiah 26, 3, thou wilt keep him, God's going to keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. And I asked the uh, PowerPoint person to put up Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, what? Think on these things. Amen? On the inside of you, is a born-again, regenerated spirit. It's a powerful, powerful, real you. 
It's your spirit, it's on the inside of you, and it always wants to get out to express itself. The whole desire of your spirit is to get out and express itself. Good. All out here is the world, the world system. Out here is the way that the world operates. And what's it trying to do? It's trying to get into you. That's right. The world system is trying to get into you. Your spirit wants to get out of you. And what's in the middle? Right here, we call it your soul. It's your mind, your will, and your emotions. And it's right in the middle. And if we can just get this soul to line up with our spirit, you become a powerful, powerful being. We can get it to line up. See, what you believe is a result of what you think. Yes, that's right. It took me a while to get that. I always thought, oh, I'm just going to, you, know, uh, you know, I'll read the Bible and then I'll just believe. But I had to take time to meditate on the Word, get the Word in me. And what I thought be uh, became what I believed. What you feel, and this one's all messed up today all over, the, all over North America. What you feel is a result of what you think. People don't realize that. They think feelings are on the top of the pyramid. But in fact, uh, 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 feelings follow thoughts. It's not the other way around. That's what the Bible says. Your feelings follow your thoughts. People get up in the morning and they're mad and they think, well, I'm just going to have a mad day all day. Right? And I guess you better not get in my way because I just woke up mad. They don't realize those mad feelings came from maybe thoughts the day before or even the week right. before. Right. You know, people wake up sad and they think, well, I'm just going to have a depressed day. That's, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches, right? Renew your mind, right? And then your feelings will follow afterward. The root of all unbelief is your thinking. The root of all feelings uh, are your thoughts. Amen? So we need to change our thoughts if our feelings and our unbelief is all messed up. I mean, today uh, in society, people are going by feelings to, to the extent that it doesn't even make sense anymore. This is what I feel, so this is what I am. And we need to be careful with that because people are just getting sucked in by the devil. Let's just let me say it. That's all that's really happening. So the bottom line is undisciplined mind becomes a problem. The highest form of captivity for anybody is mental captivity, is emotional captivity. That's the highest you know, form of captivity. And your mind needs to be put in place. Your mind needs to be trained just like when you went to school as a kid. You were trained in school subjects. You need to now be trained in spiritual subjects. Right. You need to be trained in the Word of God. You need to grow up in the Word of God. The Bible says to hold fast your confession, right, and fight the good fight of faith. Hold, fight the, or hold fast your confession and fight the good fight of faith. And what people don't realize, because we've preached it and preached it and preached it, that your confession or your words, we've left out the thinking. Because I've been pastoring and I've been working with Bible college students and people for the last, since, you know, tw 20 years, I guess. Uh, uh, and people say one thing, but on the inside they're thinking something contrary to their confession. And they haven't linked those two together. And we think just speak, 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 and it's going to come to pass. And then why isn't it coming to pass? It's because their thinking isn't lined up with their speaking. And when your spirit lines up with your thinking, right, and then your speaking lines up with your thinking, man, then you're a part, that changes are going to be a coming. <laughs> Amen? That's when changes start coming. So people can say the right thing, but they're thinking failure, they're thinking defeat, they're thinking rejection, they're thinking worry, they're thinking confusion. And your confession is more than just your words, it's actually what you think. And so if you've been saying and saying and saying and things haven't been coming to pass, stop and say, what have I been thinking? What have I been thinking on? Do I say, you know, I'm going to be successful, but on the inside of me or in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, how could it be? You know, I, I, I don't have the education. I wasn't born to the right parents. Oh, I don't have this or I don't have that like the other person. I don't have those great talents. What are you actually thinking? Because that's what it's going to end up producing in your life. When your spirit and your thinking and your, and, 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 and your speaking get in agreement, like I said, then changes are coming. Powerful, powerful living is coming. Supernatural person is coming. Amen? Uh, powerful things in God, fulfilling a purpose, that's all coming because it's all lined up with Scripture. And so I want to remind us this morning of a few things just to help adjust our minds. They may sound simple to you, but over time... Even myself, you know, you kind of just lose, you kind of just lose the power of them. Hebrews 10 says, 
you know, th it tells us how to restore our confidence. And the number one thing is call to remembrance, right? Call to remembrance is how you restore your confidence, how you, uh, how, how you uh, get back on track, so to speak, right? And so you call to remembrance the goodness of God. You call to remembrance of who you are in Christ. You call to remembrance the grace of God in your life. Someone said grace, grace this morning. And I thought, oh, that's lining up uh, really with what uh, I want to talk about this morning. It'll help steer your mind. So 1 John 3, 1 in the Message Bible. John says, what marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Look at it. We're called children of God. That's who we really are. Amen. But that's also why the world doesn't recognize us or take us seriously because it has no idea of who he is or what he's up to. I want to look at that. We are his children. That's who we really, 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 really are. Do you know how old John was when he said that? He's 84 years old, right around 84 years old. Here's an 84-year-old man reminding the church, you guys are children. Why would he be doing that? Because people were forgetting that. They were just living life and thinking, yeah, well, I'm on my way to heaven and I'm God's child, but it, 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 it wasn't real to them. It wasn't as real to them as their natural birth. It wasn't as real to them, right? And so he wanted to, 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 to get it across to them. He wanted to get them to see it and view themselves as children of God. That's huge. And that word child, or don't look at that like a baby or an infant or a juvenile. You know, the last time I was at home and I was preaching uh, uh, along the book of Fragile, a woman that doesn't really, but she knew my family, and so she came to church to listen, and she says, well, whose son are you? And I said, well, I'm John's son. And she goes, oh, I remember John. Here I am. I'm John's son. I'm 58 years old. I'm still his kid. <laughs> I'm his kid for all of the natural time on the earth. Even in eternity, I'm sure they'll know, well, you were John's kid when we were in eternity. But number one and first and foremost, even above that, once you become born again, you are a child of God. Amen? You are God's child for life. And here's John at 84 years old. He's encouraging and he's teaching people, get it. Get it because the minute you get born again, you are eternally a child of God. Don't look at it just on earth. All you do is just slip from natural uh, spiritual life into the spiritual life at death, and then you just keep going as God's child forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever throughout eternity. See, God doesn't have nephews. God doesn't have nieces. God doesn't have grandchildren. You're not the kid down the street. You are God's child forever Amen. and ever and ever, and nothing can change that. And so we have to get this attitude on the inside of us. We have to get this attitude in, in, inside of us, not because we're full of pride or we're arrogant. Oh, look at us. We're children of God, right? Or because, you know, we're self-righteous. We have this attitude because we belong to the best family that ever lived, ever will live. It is eternal. It is unchanging. God is our Father. And John is saying, remember. Remember those things. You are children of God, first and foremost. And, I, and, I, and I'm getting, trying to get to the place where I'm a child of God above my natural parents, above everything else. I'm a child of God. I believe that's why Jesus said in John 3, you must be born again. He wanted to hammer home the fact that you are born again. You're a new person. Ye must be born again just to help you know that God, you're God's kid, to help you know that God's your father. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit, Jesus said. Ye must be born again. And that should be more real to you than your natural birth. That should be more powerful to you than your natural birth. That should be uh, understood. Uh, uh, and let me say, you can't even understand it, but nevertheless, it's true. <laughs> Jesus said it's as the wind. Right? We are born of God. And um, 1 John 1.12 is the, is the scripture that hit home for me, and I realized this is truth. It's not the scripture. <laughs> um, uh, not 1 John, John 12. Okay, let's just try 13. Yeah, it's 13. I think it's the next one. 
if we can put 1 John 13 up. Or, sorry, John 1, 13. <laughs> Keep saying 1 John. But as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. No, 13, yeah. Sorry about that, I gave them the wrong one. It's my fault, not the PowerPoint person. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Amen. Born of God. Yeah. You know, the word adopted in the Bible is just really referring to a transition that took place. I don't even look at myself as adopted. <laughs> it's just actually a term used to be able to tell you what happened. You were in this family, and God put you in this family, but you are now born of God. That spirit man on the inside he is different. Yeah. It's not what you used to be. It's completely changed, and you are born of God. That word born is technon in the Greek, and it means offspring or children. You are offspring of God. Hallelujah. You are children of God. Amen? And so this is the an overriding truth that you must get on the inside of you. You belong to God first, foremost, and forever. First, foremost, and forever. First Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of, in, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God. And when you get that thinking straight, like I said, all of a sudden it's way easier to receive. Well, God's my father, so he's not withholding anything from me. God's my father, so now it becomes easier to, uh, the promises now can become alive yeah. because God's my father. And so when these promises are made, I can walk in them. You begin to have this supernatural happening in your life. You're blessed and you, you have favor. You know, you have stuff that other people on the earth don't have. True. I mean, just get that. You know, we all want to, you know, this whole equal thing, but it, it's not. You are children of God. You have stuff other people on the earth don't have. That's right all the promises of God. I'm sure, you know, Pastor Doug and Pastor Tim and whoever preaches, they talk about the promises of God. You have the other people don't have those things. They might tap into a little bit here and there because it's spiritual, right? But they can't walk around in the joy and the peace and the confidence and the, and, and, and the future that we can walk around in and that we can have. You are children of God and we have promises and we have inheritances and we have powers and we have strength that other people don't have. You are children of God. So if you're children of God, then you must have a birthright. Amen. When my parents pass away, I don't expect them to give all that money away to some other kids. They're going to give it away to their kids. And so we have an inheritance through Jesus Christ. It's a birthright or inheritance, the Bible uh, says, because we are his children. Colossians 1.12 In Colossians 1.12, I think we have that one for the screen. I think it's in... Uh, giving thanks to the Father who has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet. That means able. You know, he's the one that's made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light light. Amen? The Bible talks about what belongs to us because we're his kids. The Bible tells us what, what belongs to us because it's available to us. It's for our use. And you know, the Bible says that God gives these things freely. He gives these things without reluctance. He gives these things without a reservation because you're his kid. Right? I mean, sometimes I used to mess up at home. My mother and father then said, okay, we're not going to feed you anymore. And by the way, <laughs> go find out somewhere else to live or go out in the street there and, uh, and find a place to stay. I still got my bedroom. I still got my food, right? Because I was their kid, even when I, I messed up. God provides everything without reservation, which just means wholeheartedly, willingly, and completely. Sure, it's called, it's called the grace of God. We obtain it by faith, but he gives it freely, and, and, and willingly and completely. It's called the grace of God. It's, can, it can, grace of God can never be conditional on you doing something for it. If you have to do something for the promises of God, then it's not grace no more. It's Jesus, part grace and part what you can do for God. It's not grace anymore. Amen. And it's available through Jesus Christ. 
uh, because Jesus and we are seated together with him in heavenly places. If you have to do something to receive from God, that's not grace anymore. If you have to say, hey, God, God, look at me, look what I'm doing. I've been praying, 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 and I need an, an answer. It's not grace anymore. If you've got to get God to notice you, if you've got to get God to, uh, to do something for God, to receive from God, that's not grace anymore. Grace in its most simplest form, and I think Andrew Womack or somebody said it one time years ago, and it just went ding, ding in my spirit. It's all the promises of God in the Bible. Okay. You know, we can give all these, term, these uh, definitions to it, but I just like that one. God's grace is all, not just salvation, all the promises of God right. in the Bible. <laughs> Amen? The promises are for his kids. The Bible calls the, the Greek word sozo. Right? I'm sure Pastor Doug's talked about sozo. Uh, Romans 10, 9. Whosoever shall confess with the mouth and believe in the heart shall be sozo. Literally means to be, to be to, it literally means safety and healing and to do well and to protect and to preserve and to deliver and all these things. And my favorite one is make whole. That's what it means to be saved. God wants to make you whole. Your marriage might not be whole, but God wants it whole. Yeah. Your finances might not be whole, but God wants him whole, yeah. right? Your thinking or your mind might not be whole, but God wants it whole. Any area of your life, spirit, soul, or body, God wants those things whole. Jesus came that we might be whole, spirit, soul, and body, a complete being. John 10:10. 10, 10, Jesus came that I might have life or that you might have life and life more abundantly. So God had to give me an analogy just to wrap my head around all that. Because it sounds nice. But when he can simplify it for this farmer from Saskatchewan, right, then it really, really helps. So God gave me this analogy and he said, God said, over here is a circle, a circle of grace. I imagine it like a pool. It's like this circle, and it had like a little pony wall right around it. It's called the circle of grace. And in that circle of grace are all the promises of God. Everything is in there, of course, salvation, right? But health is in there. Financial security is in there. As for me and my house will be saved is in there, right? Uh, peace and joy is in there. A strong mind is uh, in there. A future and a hope. And everything that you might need on the earth, it's in this circle yes. of grace. And here I am over here, Barry, it's January the 2nd, 1993. I'm living in Thompson, Manitoba, and I also work for the railway. <laughs> so I, I had some land and I worked for the railway and I get born again in 84 with Squadham Bay in a house in Thompson, Manitoba in the upstairs uh, kitchen watching a little black and white 12 inch TV watching Jack Van Impey. And he convinced me that Jesus could be here by tomorrow, I better get saved. <laughs> And he's still doing that 20 some years later. And so I said the prayer instantly. I got born again. Like, you know, I don't want to give my testimony. Things change. But instantly God picked me up and he stuck me right in the middle of this pool of grace. And here I am. Everything is right here. Everything is available to me right here. I'm right standing in the middle of it. And if you're like me, what do we do? We kind of climb out of that pool of grace after we get saved and we get back over here just trying to be better. I'm just trying to be a better berry. I'm just trying to be a better berry where I don't fight so much. I don't swear so much. I don't drink so much. I don't smoke so much. I'm not, I was 32 years old, so that's my life. And I'm just trying to be better. And then all of a sudden, I need something. I need something from this pool of grace. And I see it over there, and I'm like, Lord, can I have something out of the pool of grace? I need that, I need that job. I need that financial security. I need that healing. I need some peace. And we're praying, Lord, Lord, please give it to me. I see it's in your word. It's a promise in your word. Can I have it, Lord? Thank you, Lord. Can I? And we're just trying our best. And what's God saying? Get back in the pool. Get back in the, it's yours. It belongs to you. Why are you trying to get it? It, this is where we should be praying from. It, it's ours. We're in the pool of grace. Don't try and get something that's already, uh, because you're, you're his kid. It belongs to you. What's trying to happen? The devil, the Bible says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So he's sticking his hand in there trying to get your healing. Wrap his knuckles. No healing, or not healing, health. 
I don't even like to use the word healing because you, the health is in here. Yeah. He's trying to steal your health, wrap his knuckles and say, no, you're not taking it. This belongs to me. This is mine, right? Don't, don't be trying to get it anymore. It belongs to you, right? When he reaches in there to try and steal your finances, wrap his knuckles and say, no, no, this is, my, I'm God's kid. Financial security belongs to me. It's in the word of God. You have to be able to see and pray from that place that it already belongs to you. And of course, you know, the thief comes to steal. The thief is the devil. The thief can be the world system. It loves to just try and get in there and get you in debt and get you in all these places, right? Or, or Bible even talks about some people. Some people might want to steal your joy or steal your future or tell you you're no good. Wrap, not physically wrap their knuckles, but wrap their knuckles with something because it belongs to you. It's part of being a child of God. Get back in the pool and stay in the pool and take that pool with you wherever you go. Just walk around with that pool around you like a dress or whatever. That's good. That's good. People pray, God, save this person, but let me tell you, in the mind of God, that person's already saved. It's done. People pray, God, heal this person. But in the mind of God, that person's already healed. People, people, pray, or people pray, God, help me with my insecurities. Help me with my worries, my frustrations, my confusions, my fears, my rejection, my anxiety, my guilt. In the mind of God, he's already done it. It's already been taken care of at the cross of Calvary. It's already been completed. And God's like, just go ahead and take it. You're in the pool. I mean, learn how to receive it from the pool of grace. I did put in the New Living Translation in John 10, 10. Oh, no. All right, thanks. <laughs> the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose, Jesus said, is to give them a rich and satisfying Amen. life. That's what Jesus came to do, right? And so wrap his and knuckles, and I'm talking about our position as a child of God, your place in the family. Don't get out of the circle. Don't let the thief uh, steal out of your circle. Uh, God knows and gave it to you. You're his child. And uh, another analogy that came to me when I was six years old, I remember going with my father to the McLeod store. We lived three houses behind the McLeod store, and we got myself my little bicycle, right? Well, for me, it was a so for me, it was a big bicycle because I was six <laughs> years old. Now I look at it, it's a little bicycle. I don't look at it anymore, it's gone. But when I looked at it, it was, a, it was, but it was my bicycle. My father gave that bicycle to me. A bicycle, I, you know, I would let another kid ride it, but you're not going to take my bicycle home. That bicycle is mine. My father and my mother gave it to me. It belongs in my yard. When I go to bed at night, that bicycle is going to be there. When I wake up, that bicycle is going to be there because it belongs to me. And that's the attitude you need with the things of God. They belong to you. Amen. Don't let nobody take them out of your yard and steal them. Right? Don't let anybody uh, take them away from you. They belong to you. Everyone wanted what Jesus had. Everybody wanted what Jesus had. You know, the, 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 the healing and the, and, the, and the power. Jesus was saying, God is good, and this is what he wants to give you. Jesus wasn't ashamed of financial security and prosperity. He wasn't ashamed of healing. He wasn't ashamed of anything because he knew this is what the people wanted. So that's what you have in this pool or this circle of grace. This is where we should be the most content, the most secure, the most relaxed. People see that, and then they're going to want what you got. That's really the bottom line. They're going to see that. Living to learn, or, or, or learning to live in the peace of God. Yeah. Learning to live in the security that God's given us. Learning to live just like when you were a kid growing up. You didn't worry about food and shelter and clothing. It was just like, I'm going to find fun things to do today. <laughs> that's what God, uh, uh, that's the mind of God for his kids. An attitude of expectation is also needed. We need to switch our thinking and expect what I've just been really talking about. But Jeremiah 29, 11, familiar scripture, for I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you what? An expected end in the King James. Whose responsibility is the expected end? That's ours. God knows the thoughts. He wants to get them to you. He's like, what's your expected end? That's what I want to get to you. You know, you, your life, 
needs to reflect an expected end. What's in the pool of grace that you, that you really haven't been living? God wants to get that. Don't get a, a wrong mindset. You, it belongs to you. If I go home and I walk into my house uh, and I'm uh, 58, my mother's almost 80, and I say, hey, mom, I want a sandwich. And mom's like, well, jump right up. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, no, mom, relax. I can make it. And she's like, yeah, you know, the bread's over there. And there's this meat in the fridge. And there's cheese in that crisper thing there. And tomatoes are on the counter. Anything that's available is mine. 58 years old. Whatever I want when I walk into my mother's house because I'm her kid. So it doesn't, what if I went there and took a slice of bread and then I was going for the butter. And mom's like, oh, 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 don't, don't use any butter. I'm like, oh, well, why? Well, just don't use any butter, it's very expensive, right? And then so I get my meat on my slice of bread, and then I'm gonna go and I get my cheese, and I thought, oh, I'm gonna have a, a, a nice big hoagie kind of sound. I'm gonna cut some tomatoes. I go to, and mom says, don't take any tomatoes. And I'm like, what? Well, if you go cut the grass, I'll give you some tomatoes, Barry. If you want, go and vacuum, vacuum the, the living room and the whole house, I'm go you can put some butter on your sandwich. That's how we view God, though, isn't it? That's how we view God. Anything that's available in my house, my mother gives, and God, is, the Father, is saying the same thing. But no, a lot of times we have to do something. This, we do something, we ask God for something, then we do something, and then God responds. That's our, men, our, our mindset, and it's wrong. It's not the right mindset that we should have. Majority of Christians view God this way. I don't know if you ever remember watching, how much time do I have? <laughs> if you weren't, it just dawned on me when I turned around, so I don't know if someone was pulling me. Do you ever watch Raymond? Because I don't have to tell this story. So you remember Raymond with the, it's an older show. Yeah. Was, uh, well, yeah. It's kind of, funny. Yeah, everybody loves Raymond, exactly. Yeah. I think that was the name of it, yeah. So anyways, Marie was the grandmother, and they were talking about the kids one time, and then and something happened in school, and then Marie got mad, and she says, <clears throat> she says, I don't get the kids nowadays. You know, the kid shows up in school, and the teacher says, here's a sticker. And the kids play nice in the playground, and then she, and the teacher says, oh, here's another sticker, right? And then all of a sudden, the kids do their homework, and here, here's another, and the point she was trying to get is that when they were kids, they just did those things because that was their responsibility to do. But we do that with God. We pray, we ask God for something. If he doesn't answer us instantly, what do we do? We think, I gotta go to church a little more. I'm gonna go to church three times this month uh, to make sure that, 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 that I've got this covered. Because why? We want to get another sticker from God. Right? I, I, I haven't been reading my Bible enough, so perhaps this is why I can't get my prayers answered. So I'm going to read my Bible enough, and then God will peel off another sticker and put it up there. And maybe I should, you know, I should pray more, or I should give bigger offerings, or whatever it is. We're trying to get enough stickers when God goes, okay, now you finally got it, here's your answer. So you cannot tie any works to grace. The Bible says you get nothing. So, and that's what we've kind of been doing with our thinking and our, and our, and our actions. We're tying stuff to grace. If God would give you something for that, it would take away from what Jesus did. It's impossible for him to do that. He can't do that because you're saying, give me Jesus plus my tithe and my giving and my, uh, uh, and my offerings, and then I'm going get to get the answer, and he can't. It's impossible to do that. That's stealing from God's grace and what Jesus did. When you tie your works to what God is giving freely, you get nothing. It is impossible for God to do that. One last thing then, and then we'll close. Don't throw anything out of the pool because you're not sure how it works. Right? You got this nice pool of grace, and uh, we get born again, and I, the, the railway's looking to get rid of a thousand management employees. That's when I was in Thompson and got saved. It was a short time after, and we decided, oh, we're going to go full-time farming. Right? We had some land, and we could get this year's worth of salaries and get a house and, and a half a section of land and add it to what we had. And, you know, so we had around, around seven, 800 acres of land and our house and everything. And I had this plan when I'm done, 
the first year, I got the money saved, I'm going to plant the wheat and all the crops, and then when I harvest it, I'm going to get this number one wheat, it's going to be, you know, high protein, $3.50 a bushel. Guess what happened on the first year? It froze. $1.86. And here we are, barely making ends meet. We have to get an operating loan to be able to pay all the bills and everything that year. And I'm learning from Kenneth Hagen, all the faith stuff, and Kenneth Copeland, all the faith stuff. And I'm like, Lord, this is what I'm believing for. But you know what we did? We didn't throw financial security out of the pool. Say, well, I guess that doesn't work. We stuck with it, right? We look back now on that year, and we realize no bills got missed. We paid for everything. I don't remember going hungry. Yeah, do you? No. I don't remember. I don't remember, you know, having no heat in the house that winter. You look back, and God provided, and then next year was better, and the year after was better, and pretty soon we were doing well. Yeah. When I pastored, we had a, 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 we had a person who, who came to our church, and he got cancer along the bottom of his uh, uh, intestines and his some glands. And he went to uh, Leftbridge, and the doctor says, oh, you got to go to Calgary. you got to go to Calgary because you uh, you've got um, cancer. So he goes to Calgary. Oh, no, he comes to church Sunday morning. We pray for him. For some reason, I called the board up that Sunday. We pray for him. And, uh, and uh, he goes to Calgary. And when he gets to Calgary, the doctors say, you better go back to Leftbridge because we can't find what the doctor there said you have. So we're like, wow. So he goes back to Leftbridge, and the doctor is, uh, and the and the doctor says, no, no, you have that. I got the proof here. Here's the records. You go back so to to Calgary. And so he was doing this back and forth thing for about three or four months. Finally, the doctor in Leftbridge said, uh, uh, just come every three months then. And then pretty soon it was just come once a year. And he got healed of that cancer. So I have another person who's got stomach problems too. Right? And we prayed for him a number of times, and he didn't receive his healing. Well, I don't know why, but don't throw healing out of the pool of grace. It's there. It's available to you. Right? For it, worked, it worked for this person, and, 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 and you know maybe the person is healed now. I, I don't know. I've been healed instantly, and I've also been healed by faith. And, so, and the ones sometimes when God uh, uh, allows you to be healed by faith, it takes a little more uh, uh, believing and a little more standing, right? But you're going to be way better off, you know? Because when you receive it by faith, now all of a sudden you've got healing kind of in your front pocket. Right? All of a sudden, you can get over things so much more easier. It's amazing. You know, sure, you can go in a lineup and uh, Benny Hinn or something, and people get healed instantly, but a lot of times they stumble back in because they didn't get it by faith. And when you get it by faith, all of a sudden you can affect headaches, you can affect things in your life so much easier when you get it by faith. So I look back and say, thank you, Lord. But the, if we would have thrown that out of the pool, well, our church is not going to believe in healing because this person never got healed, that doesn't work. That's not powerful. That's not a living epistle. That's not being a testimony for our Lord and Savior. And so don't throw stuff out of the pool. 2 Corinthians 1.20, and we'll close with this. Hope I have this one right. 2 Corinthians 1.20. Oh. Uh, 2 Corinthians. For the promises of God in him are yea and amen. Why? Unto the glory of God by who? Uh, by us. For all the promises in the pool of grace yes. <laughs> are for God's glory through us. That's why we want to walk in there. The Bible says you need to be a living epistle. You need to be a testimony. And people are watching. And this is why we want to have all these things operating in our life. We want to walk in the fullness of what God has for us. We want to be better every day. We want to increase every day. We want to have strong bodies, strong minds, full spirits every day. Amen? We are God's kid. Change your attitude of your mind. <laughs> right and wrong thinking. Because when that happens, 
all of a sudden the promises of God become so more real and you now have faith, I'm going to take that one and I'm going to walk in that one instead of always pulling back and thinking, well, I should try that one maybe, maybe it'll be, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work. You need to have this attitude of being a child of God, right and wrong thinking. Amen? So I hope I've helped you this morning. Adjust those things in your thinking. Begin to see like a child of God. Know you have an inheritance. Realize that it's between your ears. It's a powerful, uh, a powerful place that now you can be able to increase your faith, increase your belief in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you this morning. I pray, Father, that you uh, healed and restored whoever needed to be healed and restored this morning, that people received whatever they needed to receive this morning. People were encouraged this morning. And Father, I pray right now, even uh, as Jesus prayed for people who were vexed with unclean spirits, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Father, that they would be healed even as they, as where they sit right now this morning, Lord. A spirits of fear are leaving people. Spirits of rejection are leaving people. Sick bodies are leaving people in the name of Jesus. Uh, 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 struggling minds are being restored in the name of Jesus. And Father, as people go from this place, that they don't let the devil take it back or give it back to them, that they won't uh, accept it back. They'll say, no, no, this healing belongs to me and I'm going to keep it in the name of Jesus. And so I speak to each person in this place to receive what you have to receive this morning in the name of Jesus. It'll make strength and power available in your life to help other people and be that living epistle that God's called you to be and fulfill that destiny and purpose in the mighty name of Jesus. We give you all the praise and honor and glory for everything and anything that you've done this morning because you are the one. You are the one that gave it to us in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You hear me? All right, I'm on. I got to check now and make sure. That was awesome. That was really, really awesome, man. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I want to thank each and every one of you guys for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm sure you uh, came in one way, you're going to go it another way. Blessed, highly favored, the sound mind, never the same. Internet, thank you for joining us. We love you guys. Just let me pray for you guys. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to come before you right now, Lord. I want to thank you for everybody that's watching, Lord. Lord, I just want to thank you that you're going to touch them wherever they are, if they're in their living room, they're in their wherever, Lord. Lord, that you're there with them, Lord. And anything that they are requesting, Lord, they have it. Lord, I just want to thank you, Lord, that they're standing in that pool of grace, Lord. And they already have it. They don't need to ask. They just need to receive it, Lord. And we just want to pray. A blessing over them, Lord, that they are blessed and highly favored. They are walking in walking in the fog, Lord, in Jesus' name. And Lord, I also pray over everyone that's here, Lord, that they are the same, blessed and highly favored, walking in the fog. They're blessed coming in, blessed going out. Blessed in the city, blessed in the country. Everything they put their hands to is a success, Lord. And I proclaim that these people are your mighty people, Lord. They are more than overcomers. They are more than overcomers. They are champions. I pray an amazing week over all of them. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys are awesome.